Welcome to Hope at Night, featuring Melissa De Paiva, John Peckham. Q and A with our live audience and host Anil Kanda. Today's episode: Good God, Bad World. And here's your host, Anil Kanda. Welcome to Hope at Night. You know, in a world that often feels out of control, unfair, and full of injustice, many find it challenging to believe that there is a God who is actually good. The great theologian Augustine once said, If there is a God, why is there so much evil? And if there is no God, why is there so much good? Right now, in our quest to answer that question, we're going to be watching a clip from the movie, Return to Palau. That night after we had fallen asleep, next thing I remember is waking up to some noise in the house. My parents weren't in the bedroom anymore. I opened the door and I, I see this person that I had not seen before wearing dark clothing. And he was, my mom was trying to fight him off and I immediately got scared, didn't know what to do, so I went back and hid in their room. They were sound asleep, 3.30 in the morning, and an individual broke inside the kitchen window, and he brought no more than a rope and a piece of wood. And he started hitting Larison on the head. Then the father came to find out what was the noise, and then in the hallway, they fought. And then he also broke my son's head, his skull, and uh, he fell, and then Margaret heard the noise and comes out of the room, same hallway, and then they fight. And she also falls with her skull broken. Eventually, I came back out, and I remember just sitting in the hallway, seeing my mom right there and my dad kind of laying in the bathroom and I could hear my brother in the doorway of his room and it seemed like to me he was crying. I don't remember crying at that point, but I do remember shaking and feeling very, very numb. And then the individual came and got her and put her in her bed. He knew very well where her room was, was the first room. He tied her. Uh, with the rope that he had and went back to hit the brother. Then he came and pulls her around, telling that you are going to be my slave now. You're going to be my property. He wrapped me up in what seemed like a straw mat and put me in the trunk of his car and took me to his house. And he told me to be very, very quiet um, or else he would do to me what he had done to my parents. Late that night, he comes back. She's still there, obeying. She didn't move. She didn't make any noise. He asked me what I thought he should do with me. And I told him he should take me to the church. And I was young enough to think that it might even happen. He took me to this place, got me out of the car, there was a, a steep hill, like a ravine, and there he tried to strangle me, to choke me, and threw me down the ravine. Today we have the privilege of meeting Melissa herself. Let's welcome to Hope at Night, Melissa De Pava Gibson. Melissa, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Absolutely. After, after watching that clip again, so many thoughts and emotions were going through my mind, and I'm sure probably through yours. Uh, could you tell us, after this, this, this terrible tragedy took place, your family was murdered, and then you were taken away, what was the aftermath of this whole thing? Um, in my, I was 10 years old at the time, so in my 10-year-old mind, all that I remember feeling was shock, like this numbness um, that 
uh, you, you don't really feel much. You don't even know what to think or what to say. And I just remember kind of like shaking, you know, like when you're so nervous, you can feel like the inside of your body shaking. And that, that was my raw emotion in the immediate aftermath. Um, even until um, I was found and taken to safety. And um, until hours later, um, we're in Palau in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Anybody in our family who would, who would be able to come would at least take 36 hours to get there, you know, 30, however many. Um, so as soon as my grandma came, it was like a breath of fresh air that I, and when I saw her come into. There was um, relief. There was relief there, yes. And I, I, th I feel like I was able to release um, and not feel so much of the, of the numbness. Melissa, could you tell us, what was your family doing in the island Palau anyways? So my dad was a pastor. Uh, my mom was a teacher. She helped teach at the uh, high school, at the church school. Um, and my brother and I were just kids in for the adventure. You know, going to school, I was in fourth grade, he was in fifth grade. So to us, it was living in a paradise. It was the, the most beautiful place that you could go. If you ever have a chance to vacation, that's the spot. Wow. So your family were, were missionaries there. This terrible tragedy takes place, probably something uh, no one was expecting, especially on a no. beautiful island like Palau. The Palau people are great people. Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, Palauan people are so giving, they're so faithful, so loyal to you, and this kind of thing just does not happen on the island. This, is, uh, this was something that caught everybody by surprise. Right an honor-shame culture, this was something that hit them very hard and everybody on the island felt shame. Could you tell us a little bit more about the public reaction to this tragedy? Right, so the, the man who took their life, his name is Justin. He uh, worked for a, a company and the owners of that company were members of the church that my dad pastored. And so we knew them very well, we did not know Justin but we knew the, the company that he worked for and the owners very well. We spent time with them all the time. And so they were very ashamed that one of their employees would have done this to their pastor. Um, and the whole island, though not everybody is in the same denomination, but uh, many of the prominent people in that island, the senator, um, the uh, queen, they have a queen and a chief. They are all members of my dad's church. So uh, there, there was not only shame in that sense, but also in just culturally that somebody from their culture would take the life of a missionary that have come to help them. Um, so there, there was a lot of sadness. And in fact, when, um, in, in a few days later, people would come to visit me where I was with my grandparents and local people that had opened up their home for us, and they brought gifts after gifts. And um, as a 10-year-old, I've got hundreds of uh, stuffed animals uh, that my friends would bring. But so they, they tried to show their love and support through being present and bringing those, those gifts, and, and they, they were so sorry for what had happened on their perfect island. Right, I've seen some of the clips of, of uh, some of the royalty apologizing. The queen was at the hospital, even before my grandmother was able to come to Palau, she was at the, my hospital bed side. Um, and that was something that I didn't remember in, in the shock and the numbness. Right. I did not remember that. Um, afterwards, being able to go back to Palau and visiting, I learned that. Um, I was even able to, to meet the doctors who cared for me in a return to Palau. Um, but uh, even the president, the, there's a queen and a chief, but then there's also a political president. Uh, the, the political president of Palau was not a member of the church, but had worked with my dad a few times. He would come and, and pray for uh, political gatherings and things like that. Uh, so he, he put out a national statement and held a national funeral wow. on the island. Wow. Now your grandma, you said, flew down to be with you. What else did she do when she was down there? So my grandma also comes back, comes from a missionary background. She, she has been a missionary in Africa, in South America, in many countries, in both of those continents. And so she's familiar with living in other places and um, different cultures. And she, 
when she came to Palau, I, in her shock as well, all she could think about is, I want to go to the prison and see the face of the man who took the life of my son, my daughter-in-law, and my grandson. And uh, they, they were hesitant to take her at first because they didn't know what she was going to do. Right. What can you expect uh, from somebody who's just had their family killed? And what are you going to go do at the prison? And they, they were very hesitant, but they took her anyway. And she went there not knowing what she would say as she, as she tells the story. She said, I didn't rehearse anything. I didn't know what I was going to say. But when I got there, um, she, she said to him that she forgave him. And it, and it wasn't, I forgive you. She said, we forgive you mm. on behalf of the whole family. And we didn't even know this was happening. Of course, um, I didn't know this was ha I didn't even know she had gone to visit him at the time. So she, she offered forgiveness very quickly to him. And she said, what you did was wrong, but God can transform your heart and we forgive you. And so th that story went viral on the island and then later on it went around the world, of course. But, um, and at this point, Justin was still coming off the, uh, I think it was a methamphetamine high and he had not slept for five days. Um, he, was, he was very drugged up, and so, but he remembers that. Um, and he mentions that in the documentary. He is interviewed at the end. Spoiler alert for whoever's <laughs> not watched it. Um, but he is interviewed and he says he remembers that with such pain, um, hearing those words, even though at that time it may not have registered that he was forgiven. You know. What did life look like for you after all of this? Yeah, you, you would expect uh, to have a lot of trauma, you know. Uh, and the, of course, the trauma was there. But in the support that I got from family um, and the support that I got from community and then coming back to the United States, we came back to that same place where we, I had left from before, which was uh, the campus of Andrews University in Michigan. Um, and people just loved on us like crazy. Mm -hmm. And we had, I had so much support. And I know that's not the case for everybody who goes through something similar to this. Uh, but even then, I would wake up at night, every night, almost the same time for the next year and a half, it felt like I'd wake up at three in, in the morning and run to my grandma's bed and say, hey, I'm scared, uh, mm -hmm. can I sleep with you? Or have them come to my room and they would sing me back to sleep. It was a rough time for, for them. Um, and uh, for me, I remember during the day, I was happy, I was fine. But at night, the thoughts would come and I would ask really, deep questions like, is this man going to be in heaven? Um, mm. Or why, why did this happen to me? Or why did this happen to us? Uh, and just trying to reconcile what had happened, you know, in, in my 10 year old mind. Uh, so the next year and a half after, in the aftermath was, was a difficult time period, but it was also looking back, it was a period of a lot of growth emotionally and spiritually for me in the things that uh, my grandparents would talk to me about at night and my aunt and uncle who came to be with us to help them out. Wow, uh, the, the support of a loving family like that is, is such a beautiful thing, so needed. Yes. Years later, you decide to return to Palau. Yeah. Why? So the opportunity came to return to Palau in 2018. A tragedy happened in 2003, December of 2003. We were able to return in um, 2018, the end of the year. The, the, the church headquarters sent to Palau a psycho psychologist to be able to help us and um, just process the trauma with us because she herself had gone through similar trauma as a missionary. Um, years before and so she gave her life she dedicated her life to doing that for other missionaries so she was sent there and we've kept in contact ever since we've become great family friends and so in 2018 she presented the opportunity um, why don't we go back to Palau and uh, visit and see see uh, see what happens you know right um, would you be interested in going and I was like absolutely I want I've always wanted to go back to Palau because she remembers uh, at the funeral that was held there that I said as a young kid uh, when I was 10 years old that one day I'm coming back to Palau wow that's courage that's healing right there 
It was, and it, it did take a lot of healing. And, and a lot of people told, I was married by, by then when we went back, and a lot of people told my husband, like, be careful, be careful with her. Um, she might have uh, flashbacks, you know, she might have PTSD that shows up all of a sudden. And um, just, just watch out, you know, this is a, this is a big deal going back for her, going back to this place. But, but thank God, the, the, the healing that, that he can um, create back. If he created you, he can fix you, right? right, right. So that healing um, was there for me and I was able to go back with no, uh, I, I didn't experience the flashbacks. Uh, of course, I remember very well what happened, um, even going back into that very house. Um, I, we were able to do that and with a feeling of the Holy Spirit being there. Right. When we understand that um, God does exist and Holy Spirit is a real feeling sometimes. No, you don't always feel Him, of course, in your day-to-day -day life. It's, um, but in some, some times in your life, He just shows up uh, very, very prominently. You didn't hear anything, of course. You right, don't, right. Not a voice that speaks to you. It's just a peace. A sense of His presence yes, and comfort. Right? Yes, a sense of comfort, a sense of peace and presence that was there. So you went back to Palau you're probably able to reconnect with many of those church members. Some of them probably now had gray hair or grayer hair yeah. at that time. And then you, you went back to that same house. But there was an arrangement made also where you met face to face with the man who took the, the life of your family. What transpired during that time? Yes. Yeah, so, um, we went, since my husband was a pastor, he, we were able to do like a mini, uh, we, they call it a camp meeting. So it's like a Wednesday through the, the rest of the weekend, every night meet at church and talk about things. Um, um, and so that was one of the main reasons we said we would go. Of course, we didn't want to just go back for tourism. We wanted to go with a mission. Um, and to be able, and side note, it was very cool to see my husband um, preaching in the same church that my dad preached at. Wow. Um, but so we, we were there for over a week and I, somebody asked me in the beginning of the week if I would be, if I was going to be visiting Justin in jail. And before leaving home, I, I didn't know if I wanted to see him, but and I definitely didn't know if he wanted to see me. You know, it, it was it was maybe a two-way street there. I didn't I don't want to go intentionally inflict more pain on somebody if they're already feeling uh, terrible about this. Um, but somebody asked me that question, and like I, and then I knew that I had to go. And so we decided to go at the very end of the week, so we wouldn't cause a commotion. Mm. You know, and we wasn't we weren't announcing to anybody that we were going to go, except for the people who absolutely needed to know, and the people who were going with us. And so my, my grandparents, doctor, the doctors Hamill, um, her and her husband, or the, the, she's the psychologist that was, has been a part of our family and the story, um, and her husband, uh, myself, my husband, and the pastor who baptized him, uh, and a few others, uh, the now president of the country was also there. And um, we, we went into the, into the prison, into the visitation room, and all we had planned was that we were going to pray for him and congratulate him on his new journey with God because he had gotten baptized uh, recently in the, in the last year or two uh, at that time. So we, we went there knowing that we were going to offer a prayer and not expecting anything more or right, right, um, right. not expecting him to say anything. But it turned out when we came in, they, they seated us. He's on the other side of the, this white folding table. He's not shackled. He's free. Guard is in the corner. Um, there's not much, n not much uh, you could do on an island, right? There's nowhere to go. So the security isn't as as you would expect here. Uh, but we felt very safe, and he had words for us. And he had prepared kind of like the speech of remorse and how he felt so sorry for what had happened, and that he does not live life the same since that happened. He lives with, um, he lived with nightmares for a long time from what he had happened and getting baptized and coming to an, into a relationship with God had changed his life around, even though he was still in jail and would be for the rest of his life. 
and he ex uh, expressed remorse for each one of my family members by name, my mom, my dad, my brother, and said that he wanted to continue the legacy that they had uh, started on the island. My dad in preaching, that uh, he would preach to other inmates and my, my mom as a teacher that he would teach, and my, my brother, he, he loved technology, he worked the sound system and all that. He's like, I wanna bring church live stream into the prison. And so these are, these are the ways that I wanna continue their legacy. And so um, then, then we were able to share some thoughts as well, and then we kind of went down the line, and when it got to me, um, I didn't know what I was gonna say because I didn't know how I was feeling. And, and as soon as I started talking, I started crying, so I didn't say much. Right. But the, the only thing that, that did come to, to my mind and from my heart, it says, we're, we're all sinners just like you. We're not better than you for not having done what you did. Um, but we all need God's forgiveness and right. hope to see you in heaven. Wow. And that, that was all I could say. Right. Um, I'm surprised you even got any words out. Me too. <laughs> yeah, that. Melissa, as you're looking back on this whole experience, even now, what has been your image of God through all of this? Yeah, it's, it's easy to look back and say, God was definitely not there when this happened. He had taken a step back or he was taking a break, whatever it might be. Um, but I can't say that because I, in the face of fear, in the face of being numb, I still had that thought in the back of my head that the that God is with me and I that's that's what I could pray as a 10 year old is like God please save me please help me and um, in in having my grandparents so early on in the aftermath teach me about the reality of a cosmic conflict that there is evil in the world not maybe not because God wants it or uh, because God created it um, but that there's something bigger going on behind the scenes that we're not we're not allowed to see. We, we, don't, we don't know have, all the details. Yeah, we don't know the details. So and and in everything, God is still good because He can take any situation and turn that into something useful. Um, I read a book. Uh, I think it's uh, Lisa Tur Turkhurst. I'm not actually sure how to say her name about forgiveness. And she said, God doesn't waste our suffering. Right. Um, Though he did not want it, and that may not have been his plan in the first place, he can use our suffering and bring growth and bring something beautiful out of it. Um, and sometimes that takes days to see, years, a lifetime, and sometimes we'll probably just know in heaven why things happened. But um, to answer your actual question, my view of God, I, I see God as someone who works not just in the big picture, but in the pixels. Mm. And in my view of life, I only see the pixels where he sees the big picture. And I, I don't need to know the details when I'm with somebody who I trust. And of course, I didn't learn that overnight. Right. That came as a process. And, f and those sleepless nights at first and talking uh, things out and realizing that God may have not wanted this to happen, but he still brought me through it. Melissa, thank you so much for, for having the courage to share with us. We're going to continue this discussion. We've been talking with Melissa about the terrible tragedy that befell her and her family. When we come back, we'll unpack more on the difficult topic on whether we can reconcile the idea of a good God with an evil world. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. One of the greatest existential questions of life is, if God is all powerful and entirely good and loving, why is there so much evil in our world today? We've been talking with Melissa about the terrible tragedy that befell her family and the impact it had on her image of God. Right now, we're gonna meet with professor and author of the landmark book, The Odyssey of Love. Let's welcome to Hope at Night, Dr. John Peckham. being here. Come on in. Dr. Peckham, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, you've been hearing Melissa's story. Uh, you're taking it all in. And, and as someone who has written on suffering and has written on the problem of evil, 
how do we understand this concept of theodicy, this concept of good God, but evil world? The first thing I would want to say is that no matter what else we say, we want to make sure that we don't give the impression or try to explain away evil as if it's not that bad after all. Right. The God of the Bible hates evil more than we do. And whenever we suffer, he suffers. Mm. So there are many things in this world that take place that God does not want to take place. Now, many people have the idea in their head that if, if something happens, it must be because God wants it to happen, right? He's all powerful. But the Bible tells a very different story where God himself laments over evil. Things happen that he does not want to have happen because humans and other creatures misuse the free will that he has given them. Right. Uh, you, you brought up, up this idea of God being all powerful and I think that's the tension there, isn't it, right? Uh, yes. We talk about a God who's good, a, a God who is loving, and, and anyone, whether they're a Christian or a Hindu or a, a whatever religion, uh, religious affiliation they have, the idea of God is, is the idea of a being that has all power, all knowledge. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't he stop, stop this problem of evil? Yes. Well, there's a number of different ways of answering that question. Uh, and we don't always know why God does what he does or refrains from doing the kinds of things that we might think that he does. And so the first thing we always need to remember is that there are many things we do not know. There are many factors in the background that God knows about and he knows the end from the beginning, but we don't see those factors, we don't know. So what we think God should do or not do, it might turn out to be far worse in the long run if God did what we think he should do, right? Uh, in other cases, there are things that God may want to do but for God to act in that way would go against some commitments that he has made. So for instance, throughout scripture, we see a picture of a God who grants creatures free will. Why does he give this kind of free will? Uh, even if it means that creatures can use it to do evil things, because love requires free will. You can't force someone to love you, right? You cannot, even if you could control their mind and make them act as if they loved you, that love would not be genuine. So if love requires genuine freedom and God is love and he wants a love relationship with creatures and for creatures to be able to enjoy love among one another, then he must grant free will. But that free will includes within it the possibility that creatures, including humans, will misuse that free will to do what is opposed to love, which is to do evil. And so it's not a matter of God lacking power to prevent uh, evils, but for God to do so might go against commitments he has made, including to free will and other commitments uh, in the cosmic conflict that was referenced earlier. Do you think that tension is easy for believers to hold on to, 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 to accept? No, it's not easy. It's not easy to understand and it's not easy to accept. Uh, if we think about it uh, very carefully, even at that juncture, we will say, okay, so even if I could accept that there's evil in this world that God created good because creatures have misused their free will, it still seems to be the case that there's a lot of evils in this world that an all-powerful God could prevent without undermining anyone's free will. Right. Like a well-placed dream or a well-placed vision, the kinds of things we see happening in the Bible. It seems like God could intervene in those kinds of ways and prevent the evils we see around us. And so it seems like there must be much more to the story than just this God of love who gives creatures the ability to make choices, including moral choices for this great reason, because otherwise it would undermine love, which is the greatest value in the universe. But even that doesn't answer the question. And nothing will answer all of our questions because we're not God. We should not expect to be in a position to understand everything. But there must be more to the story. There must be more going on here that we don't see. Could you help us develop a little bit more and understand a little bit more of this, of this framework of how we are to truly understand life? Well, Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 13. He tells a parable of a landowner who sowed good seed in his field. But then, well, he was sleeping, an enemy came in and sowed noxious weeds mm. in that field. And they sprang up and they grew together for a time. And later, the, the, the servants of this landowner, they come to him and they say, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Why then does it have all these weeds? Which is the same kind of a question that people ask of God today, right? Didn't God create a good world? 
And if he did, then why is there evil in it? Right. His answer was, an enemy has done this. Hmm. An enemy has done this. And then his servants ask him the follow-up question. They say, okay, well then, then, then why don't we just go and pull the weeds up? Just get rid of evil, right? The same kind of question people ask today. Okay, so, so there's an enemy of God. Someone has misused their freedom to do evil, but why doesn't God just go in and eliminate it? Pull it up. And the answer again is profound. He says, no, because if you prematurely uproot the weeds, they're entangled with the wheat. And so by pulling it up prematurely, you might actually uproot some of the wheat. In other words, for some reason that we don't always understand, for God to prematurely root out evil would actually do more harm than good in the short term. Wow. Now, when Jesus tells his, his disciples, explains his parable, he makes it very clear that he's the landowner, but the enemy that sowed those seeds is the devil. Hmm. So something much more is going on, what we call a cosmic conflict or a conflict between good and evil in this world that we often don't see. Okay, the way you're setting this up is, look, there is a, a, a God who is love. He values freedom of choice. That is very important to him because without freedom of choice, love just doesn't exist. It cannot exist. Right. Uh, you, you let us know that there are decisions that are made here and, and those decisions could not be or cannot be stopped or should not be stopped oftentimes because if God was to do so, there would actually not be choice that exists. But then you're letting us also know, look, there's an antagonist yes. in our world. Mm -hmm. Could you flush that out a little bit more for us? The concept of a devil, is it just this leotard wearing, yeah. uh, yoga pant wearing, uh, demon looking uh, devil with the pitchfork? Uh, could you tell us a little bit more? What does the Bible actually say about this antagonist? Yes, yes. So the concept that many people have of the devil is, is, is really a mistaken concept. They have this kind of caricature, cartoonish figure, right? But the Bible describes the devil as originally created as an angel of light, mm. created perfectly good by God but misuse his freedom to rebel against God and against love and, and fall from that station. And he is described later in the New Testament, Jesus himself describes him as the ruler of this world, which means he has some real and significant jurisdiction in this world temporarily. Wait a minute, God is all powerful. Right. Uh, there's no one more powerful than God. That's what makes him God. Yes. And then you, you got, an angel, a fallen angel, right. uh, there's no power struggle here. God is obviously right. the champ here. That's right. Could you break that, break this down a little bit more for us yeah. then, to understand this tension then? That's right. So if it, was a, if it was a conflict or a struggle of sheer power, there could be no conflict. God is all powerful. Right. So the conflict must be of another kind. Mm. It's actually a conflict over character. And if you were to look at the Bible story from beginning to end, you see that from the beginning to end, the devil is a deceiver. He's a liar. Jesus calls him uh, the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. And from the very beginning of the story to the end, he slanders God's character. So he can't dethrone God by force. He doesn't have the power to do so. But what he tries to do is undermine God's authority in a universe of free beings by causing people to question God's goodness, to question God's love, to question God's law. And that kind of, those kinds of allegations not only uh, are they allegations that can be lodged by someone less powerful, uh, they also can't be answered by a show of power, right? Which is what we all want. That's what we want. We want God to step in and just put an end to evil just, immediately to stop this bad guy. That's right. So, so if you imagine uh, like a mayor of a town who's accused of corruption, they're falsely accused of corruption, right? They're, they're not corrupt. But if they were then to use all of their power to squash the allegations and squash the people raising the allegations, would that clear their name or make the problem worse. <laughs> make the problem worse. It actually make right. the problem worse unless first there was some demonstration of their innocence or demonstration of their goodness or demonstration of their character. And that is what we see playing out in this world, a demonstration that the, the, the devil's allegations are false and that God is truly good. Not for God's sake, but for the sake of the entire universe. Because the only way the universe can flourish is if everyone uh, trusts God unreservedly mm. and trusts his goodness unreservedly. So God is not doing it for himself, he's all powerful. He doesn't have to defend his name. He's doing it for the sake of love. If you think your beloved uh, is a tyrant or you think your beloved is, is really evil and not really good, unless those kinds of misgivings or doubts are cleared, there cannot be a true, genuine, full love relationship mm. of the kind that the entire harmony of the universe is based on. Uh, Dr. Peckham, as you've set up this amazing 
clarification, understanding of this framework, you should say, of how we can understand, better understand the, the, the elements that are in this world, and you still come face to face with just utter evil. Yeah. How do you process that? The way to process that is to remember that there are many things that we do not know. Hmm. Even when all of our answers fall short, and they do, you know, the Bible tells us a lot of things that helps us make sense of the framework in which we can understand why God would uh, not step in to intervene to, to stop this evil event or that evil event. And yet still there are questions in our mind because we don't know what we don't know. And at that right. point I say there's one place that we can look and that is to the cross. Hmm. So in the cross you have the Son of God, God himself who becomes human who allows humans to torture and kill him in order to save the very people that are torturing him. Now, that kind of God, the God of the cross, he can be trusted even when all other kinds of explanation, everything else that appears around us fails. That kind of God can be trusted. Because if we think about it, if there was any other way for God to deal with the problem of evil in the world, uh, wouldn't he have chosen it? Even if you might be tempted to think, oh, maybe God isn't good after all. Right. Maybe he's selfish. Maybe he isn't, doesn't really have our best interest in mind. The God of the cross, Jesus, shows that to be utterly false, because if there was any other way, he would have chosen it. And so we can ask the question that's actually raised in Isaiah 5, what more could he do that he has not done? And when you look at what Jesus has done for us, and in the cross, there's nothing more that could have been done. Dr. Peckham, a, a lot of Christian theologies out there don't really address how God is going to put an end to ultimately to suffering or to yep. sin or to evil. But what you're, you're telling us is, look, God is seeking to put in sort of an, an eternal end, an ending, a uh, finality to the problem of evil that it will not exist again. It, like the Bible says, affliction shall not rise up a second time. That's right. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow. That's right. And you're saying it's through the cross God is accomplishing that. What took place on the cross uh, that is actually bringing about this accomplishment? Yes. So among other things, the cross utterly shows the devil's allegations to be false and to be a lie. Through the cross, Christ demonstrates the righteousness of God. This is in Romans 3. And in Romans 8, he demonstrates the perfect love of God, that while we were still sinners, Christ dies for us. So he demonstrates through the cross event once and for all that God is fully just and God is fully love. He demonstrates God's justice because it makes a way for God to save uh, sinners and remain just. And he demonstrates God's love that Christ would actually give his life for us. Mm. And that defeats the allegations of the devil. And all that God has done throughout what we call this cosmic conflict, all that he has done shows and demonstrates that God is good and God is righteous. And that demonstration is necessary before God finally uses his power to put an end to evil and put an end to suffering. And Paul promises us in Romans 8 that looking forward to that day, he says the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed. So in the end, we will, we will see there will be no more suffering or pain or death or dying for the former things have passed away. But going back to the peril, parable, if God was to do that prematurely, without this full demonstration, uh, then evil would just fester. It would only make the problem worse, at least as long as God is going to give creatures free will, the kind of free will necessary for love. And what you're saying is because the problem of evil is so dynamic, so complex. God is seeking to put an end to it, but this requires, this is a process for God to prematurely to act and put an end to it would not actually solve the problem in the long run. Right. It, it, would, it would fester or reappear. And so God is looking for an eternal solution to this problem even while securing our freedom of choice. That's right. Uh, Dr. Beckham, I, I feel like we're just getting started here. But right now it's time to go to a break, but when we come back, we'll get to hear some questions from our live audience for our guests tonight, so don't go away.
Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've been discussing whether we can reconcile the idea of a loving God with the realities of suffering and evil. Right now, I'd like to turn to our live in-studio audience. First of all, how do you react or relate to what's been shared today? Right over there. Hi, thank you guys so much for sharing. Melissa, your story was, um, it was very inspirational because, you know, there, towards the end it got better. Um, but it was also very sad, even from the clip we saw, to you, you know, giving your testimony about your experience. I don't understand how anybody could really stand tall, let alone, you know, live now if they experience that. Uh, I can't fully wrap my head around it. But I, I just wanted to say that your story really touched me. And I know um, just from sitting here, other people didn't even really know how to ask you a question because your testimony spoke, you know, so much. And it's really inspiring because it just gives people hope. It shows that if, if you do believe um, for yourself that you can kind of will yourself out of something eventually that um, it can get better. And it sucks that it has to happen for it to get better, because if it didn't happen, then it doesn't really get better, right? Um, but it, it was really moving, and I, I literally don't understand how anybody, like, it's a, it's a miracle. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. Why don't we take some questions? We've got any questions? Right over there. My question is for the professor. Um, if God is omniscient, how come you didn't have the perspicacity to know that Lucifer would become the devil and not create him? Yeah, it's a great question. And so the first thing I would want to say is that evil did not catch God by surprise. So he did know beforehand. The Bible does describe that he, he has foreknowledge, so he knows the future free will decisions of creatures before they take place. So why didn't he use that foreknowledge? Many people ask, and I think this is what you're asking, like he, he could have just not created uh, the creature who fell and became Satan, right? Why doesn't he just use that power to not create him? And there's more than one possible way to answer that question. I don't claim to know. <laughs> I'm certainly not God. I don't claim to know what the answer is, but there's at least two possible solutions. I don't know what, if, if either one of them is correct. Uh, but one of them is that perhaps if God were to use his foreknowledge and say, well, I'm just not going to create Lucifer uh, because he's going to do all these horrible things, it might be that someone else would have arisen that would be even worse, right? It might have been worse on the whole for the entire universe if God had used his foreknowledge in that way, in ways that we cannot actually understand or foresee because we don't know the end from the beginning. But then you can say, well, why, doesn't, why wouldn't God just use his foreknowledge each time, right? Anytime someone might sin or do evil, he just doesn't create that individual, that angel or that creature. And it seems to many people, many thinkers, that if God were to use his power that way, that none of us would really have free will. We would just think that we did. We would feel as if we did, but actually no one would ever actually have the power to exercise their free will to act in any way other than the way God wants them to because he's already taken it away preemptively. Even if we didn't know it, he would know it. And if God is really love and going to grant genuine freedom, it seems like he can't use his foreknowledge in that way to stop someone from coming to existence just because he knows they're gonna misuse their free will. Uh, those are a couple of ways that people approach the question. Again, I, I don't claim to know, only God knows, but those are some ways of thinking about it. Dr. Beckham, when you read scripture, there are indications that God doesn't always act upon his foreknowledge of, of events or situations or decisions. Right. He, he acts in a in, in very principled way with the, the, almost as if he is wanting to give that individual the most amount of opportunities to do what's right, to be saved. I mean, you, you can read example of, of him working with Judas. He had an understanding of who Judas was, but he gave Judas every incentive to do what's right. Yes. And that's really fascinating because I, I think that it, that is really helping us to understand that when the Bible says God is love, He truly is love. Yes. I was thinking of that exact same example of Judas, that Jesus already knows the character of Judas, right? Have I not chosen you? <laughs> but one of you is going to betray me, right? He knew what was going to happen. Uh, but, he, but, but God, Jesus in the Gospels and God more broadly in Scripture, 
uh, he takes the long view, right? And so you have one of my favorite verses in 2 Peter 3 tells us that God is long suffering mm. toward evil. And why? Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. So it says, God is not slow about his promises, right? But he is long suffering because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but for as many as possible to have the opportunity to come to repentance. So God is acting in a way to bring about the greatest good in spite of all the evil in the world in ways that don't always make sense to us. Right. But if we could see and know everything he knows, all of these factors behind the scenes, including unseen factors, right? In, 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 with demons and angels and all kinds of factors that the Bible sometimes brings to view, but we typically don't see around us, then we would understand why God acts the way he does at times uh, and why he refrains from acting in ways that we might think that he should, but he has very good reasons uh, for acting as he does. It's, it's fascinating. When you read the book of Job, you obviously read about this dialogue between God and Job, uh, God and Satan, and, and Job gets thrown into the midst of it. And when all this tragedy happens to Job, when Job talks to God, the idea of Satan and the devil is never even brought up. That's right. That's right. And, th and that's really fascinating. There yes. were just some things that Job was not privy to, that's right. but to the reader, the curtains are drawn back and say, look, there's more than meets the eye here. Yes. Fascinating. Any other questions? Right over there. So my question is for you, Melissa. Um, I personally believe that some sins just can't be forgiven. Um, how are you able to forgive Justin after such um, such a violent sin that he committed? That's a great question. And oftentimes when I think of forgiveness, um, I think that it, it's a journey and a process that you go through. Um, for some people that happens quickly, and for other people that happens over many, many years, or it never even happens. But um, I think you share that belief with a lot of people in the world, and I, I think we all have the tendency to believe that, but I think I've, I've come to the point to, uh, in my life to be able to see that if I'm a sinner to God, all sins are the same, but if I'm not the one in charge of who gets saved and who's not saved, and if I've been forgiven, um, I should also forgive somebody else. And um, I, I know it's, it's not the most intuitive thing. You have to wrestle with things like this because it, it, in the world that we live in, we don't, we, it's not a perfect world, of course, and I don't think God made it um, something that we can't achieve. I think um, in, in, the, in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned for the first time and God comes and asks them what happened and then he, he gives the, the, this uh, statement, he's like, I'm gonna put enmity between you and Satan. And so in some way he's giving us, we're under the dominion of sin, but he's giving us this will deep inside to want to fight against that. <laughs> Um, and until we notice that it's there, until we know, like, kind of reconcile and see what, what is this that I'm feeling? Like, I don't want to do this, but I know that I probably should do this. And there's something inside of me that um, wants to forgive. Just help me get there. And then that's, that's that enmity that God puts in us. And like, you don't have to live this way. You can fight um, and you can bring these things up with God, wrestle it out with God. Uh, they're hard topics, but it, it I think it can happen. Like you, in in the journey of forgiveness, um, so many so many things can happen. Rewriting the story of your life, you know. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if I've answered your question completely, but um, I I do I do resonate with that question a lot because it wasn't like that for me at first. Right, and and I appreciate the way you've addressed this, and we've learned in the past that. Forgiveness is, is not necessarily reconciliation with the person or that that person shouldn't be right. in jail or, or face some kind of consequence, but forgiveness is something that you don't have to carry. Right. You know, anymore. And it, it, it's, it's very apparent, not saying, you know, you're completely done with the situation or the event, but it's very apparent, from my perspective at least, that um, God's produced something beautiful in your heart and your very soul. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is very impressive. I think it's, um, to those that are hearing your story, this is, this is full of hope. 
Yeah. If I can, if I can add to that, forgiveness isn't something that comes natural to us because it's not a part of our sinful nature, but it is something that comes um, from God that flows through you to somebody else if you so choose to allow that channel to be opened. And, and forgiveness is a choice, right. but not because the person deserves it. Nobody ever deserves forgiveness, but for your own health and for your own wellness and not choosing to live with somebody's actions on your shoulders, it releases yourself more than it releases the other person from what they've done. And like you said, it's not, it's not always reconciliation. If somebody abuses you, you're not gonna go back into that lifestyle, you know, uh, if possible. Um, but it is letting weight off your shoulder. I'm saying, God, you deal with this now. You, you can bring into judgment what you feel best because you see the, the whole big picture. That's right, beautiful. Any other questions for us? Right over there. Hi. So I feel like an overall concept of Christians and even non-Christians alike is that when you have a problem or you have a burden, you can take it to the Lord in prayer. But what we're also hearing from you is that God is love. So my question is, what is the point of praying to God for help if he can't interfere because of free will and his ability to give people free will? Yes, this is an excellent question. And so I wanna make it very clear that even though God operates within certain parameters and we don't always know what those parameters are and he respects free will, that doesn't mean that he cannot intervene and act in the world. So the Bible is filled with God doing miraculous things and I believe God is doing miraculous things around us all the time that we don't even realize that he's doing. So God can and does intervene and intervene strongly and when we, when we pray, there's many texts in the Bible that talk about God saying things like, if my people pray, then I will hear them and, and I will act in response to those prayers. And so prayer can open up avenues for God to do things he already wants to do within this cosmic conflict. Uh, it's almost as if when people pray and pray fervently that God has a moral permission to do even more. But even apart from our prayers, he can act and intervene in the world. Uh, it's just that he can't always do everything that he might want to do at that moment because there are so many other factors involved or because he knows that if he were to act that way now, there would be worse collateral damage down the road in ways that we cannot see. But God can and does act and intervene in the world and he can and does respond to prayer. Not always in the way that we might like him to respond, but again, we don't know all of the other factors. And sometimes what we're praying for, we're praying for the wrong thing. We're praying with the wrong motives, or we don't understand what would actually take place if God acted the way we think that he should. But he always hears our prayers, and he is capable uh, of acting in the world, and he does. In, in the very fact that, that we have an understanding that God does many times respect freedom of choice should actually encourage us to pray more. That's right you know, uh, to ask God to do even more, yes. you know, in case that there is some kind of block or situation here. This is why you read a lot about uh, intercessory prayer in scripture. That's right. That's what I mean by, you know, gi giving him a more moral license to do what he already wants to do because it opens up an avenue, right? And so if I'm asking him to intervene in my life, for instance, uh, he doesn't have to contravene my free will. And in, 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 other, in other circumstances, it can open up avenues for God to do even more things in the world. That's right, fascinating. We got time for another question, right over there. Um, Melissa, you've had such a unique life. If you had the power to change and do something differently in your life, what would you do differently? When you think about it, um, and you, if you had the power to just rewrite your whole life, I don't know that I'd have the same relationship with God that I do now if nothing bad had happened to me ever. Um, and yeah, I probably would not have chosen what, what happened um, in losing the most close to me, the, those who are most close to me. Um, but I can't say now looking back and seeing what God has done and what he's done with this story, um, what he's done with my life and what he's done with somebody else's life too. I don't think it would be worth it to change my life uh, to rewrite any part of it because it has brought me here today. That is a challenging um, question to answer, but I, I think you've really addressed in a way that's just very honest and, and understanding of, of 
what God's done for you. Not, no one's calling for a justification of any of the evil that was done or want that to happen ever. Yeah. But just in looking back, you, you're telling us, look, um, at least all the, the ways that God brought you to this place, to this, this, this location where you're at, this spiritual location, you're thankful for being at this spiritual location. Yeah. The path there, <laughs> that's God's business, you <laughs> know, and you know, of course we'd rewrite it. And I, I'm sure God would love to rewrite that, you know, but mm -hmm. at least the spiritual location you can give God thanks for, right? Yeah, and I, I think sometimes we want to write this perfect story, but the way that it actually happened shows God's power even more. Because mm -hmm. if it was a perfect story, I'm like, well, that was perfect, who, who cares, you know? But in God being able to come through and show His power, as you're saying, um, there are things that happen out of our control and in, in the long run, it is a demonstration of not only God's power, but God's love and mostly God's character. Um, and, and I think if you, if you were to think about uh, Justin's life, the, the man who killed my family, eventually getting baptized and giving himself, uh, giving his life over to God, it's, was it worth it? for three people to have died for him to have life. And you just see like the story of the Bible replay itself over and over again in the story of the world. You know, the, of God's redeeming power. Um, it may not have been what we've chosen or what I would have chosen, but it just seeing that he's, his life is now also saved helps me feel better about what happened. All right, you've recognized God bringing good out of this tragedy, right? right. That's wonderful. Melissa, thank you so much for sharing with us. Dr. Peckham, thank you so much for leading us in this discussion. It's been fascinating, amazing. I'll never forget this episode. We've seen that the Bible upholds both the sovereignty of God and human freedom. For God to be truly loving, it's mind-boggling to realize that God actually places limits on His power to allow for the risk of us not loving Him back. While the unseen battle rages between good and evil, God and the devil, we see at the end of it all, God's love is still at the center of this cosmic drama. But what are your thoughts on the existence of evil in light of a good God? Come visit our Facebook page at Hope at Night and share them there. For more information on the Return to Palau documentary, please visit our website at hopetv.org slash hopeatnight. Thanks again for joining us today. We'll see you next time on Hope at Night.